So I went to what was billed as the friendliest college in America. And uh, that's where my understanding of small groups and of, of groups came into being and sense of community. By sense of community, I mean an environment characterized by togetherness and sharing. There's a sense of group loyalty and group support. The leaders in the environment go out of their way to be helpful. There's a sense of cohesiveness. The environment is a community. I didn't have that definition, I just experienced it. And it was something very important to me that I wanted to learn this group idea at this point. And uh, so I wanted to battle the difference. I had gone to New York and my first job and it was totally different from meeting somebody in the student union at Quincy College, the friendliest college in America. And I thought, well, I want to bottle the difference. So in any event, for 15 years, I worked at trying to figure this out. The little card was, a, a, you know, output of that uh, work. The primary values was an output of that work. But there was something missing, okay? because I was just trying to understand it from a, a humanistic level. And until God is at the center of a group, you cannot get the kind of community that you get. It was a Franciscan college, and so uh, that was very important. So here I am. I had to work. Uh, I did spend, uh, I had made some money, and I spent some time full-time trying to do this, thinking that um, if there was a great need for something, then you could make money at it. Uh, that's wrong. There's a lot of things there's a great need for, it, and you can't make any money at all for it. So that didn't work, and my family is a very business-minded family that wondered, what, what, are you, what are you doing here? You know, we don't quite get it, you know? So in any event, I'd been working on it for a long time, 15 years, and I did see it as truly in the best interests of others, but I couldn't get any place. Then I faced great adversity in my personal family, in my, uh, my brothers and my sisters, and we were a very tight family, and out of that adversity, the family became broken apart. And um, whenever that happens, and it was a business-minded family, whenever that happens, there's a uh, a terrific internal upheaval, something that you love so much uh, is going in the wrong direction or you're being pulled apart and so forth. So in any event, um, I found from those people that I was living with, you know, uh, doing business with, they were quick to point out the things that I was doing that were wrong. And I had a little group, Marianne and uh, a friend and priest and so forth that I'd go back to that group about to understand what what I should be doing different. A lot of things I found that they were right I needed to change. And also my locate work itself was one of trying to improve myself. And um, so I had found a lot of junk in my life. Um, a lot of junk. And this is even after I was blessed with Marianne uh, who was, uh, you know, my, my saving grace uh, when Marianne and I met and we got married. She's been so good for me and good for my children and everything else. So, but still, we have these other factors going on. So I found so many things inside myself that I needed to change that I wondered, what else is there? And, of course, I'd come to the, you know, the realization of, you know, Christ is, you know, that's the center of my life. So I decided to spend 40 days of prayer and fasting in order to uh, see. I had this thought that, you know what, if I stop doing certain things, kind of like think about drinking coffee. Okay, if you stop drinking coffee for a while, you might find some changes in your body that you didn't, weren't even aware of that became part of your system because you've been doing it all this time. I thought, well, there could be other things like that too. I mean, you know, how much is this? I thought of like a farmer who uh, is plowing his field and uh, he thinks it's great, it's got no, no rocks in it, and then one day his, his uh, till uh, hits a rock, and he's like, oh, that's pretty amazing. And he digs out this rock, it's a pretty good sized rock. 
Then he starts looking around and he sees a whole bunch of other rocks that he's got to pull out. Humility is realizing that you need to change, you know, that you find a lot of rocks in your field. So I thought I'd spend 40 days of prayer and fasting. I would go into work. I had my own business. I'd go into work, make sure everything was going well. And I'd come back and I'd do this uh, period of austerity. And I didn't have anything in mind in particular, but I had this thought. I wonder if I should keep doing this loquate thing. Is this thing just a vanity kind of thing? You know, and I said, you know, God, I'm really making myself open to you. If I'm not supposed to be doing this, I'll just drop this. And um, so, and I didn't, it didn't matter about the time. It was just uh, a period of time. I mean, it wasn't counting the days or something. And what turned out to be the 40th day of this, uh, I had a vision. And I was praying in bed. It was the middle of the night, uh, you know, like about 2 o'clock in the morning. I would wake up and I would pray my rosary. I was wide awake. And this vision wasn't outside of myself. It was inside myself. And I knew I had an anticipation that something was going to happen to me. And um, then in laser beam like light came the first panel, which was red cubes, about 10 red cubes, kind of like in the shape of a figure S. And these were pretty good sized cubes. You can see it over here in this picture. I just had that done last night um, by an artist. I've never before presented um, a visual thing of this, and it's not something I usually talk about. And the cubes represent the failings. My interior understanding of this was that these are the ways inside myself that hurt and harm other people. They exist within us, each of us, and exist, exist in me. And so, um, and I also felt uh, the power of Satan. That was a secondary portion of this vision. The primary portion was the vulnerability of the power of Satan. The fact that those, those cubes are misaligned, you can see they're not all lined up straight. It would take a little bit of doing to push them over or to get them done, but they were vulnerable. That was the main understanding that I had from that, that the power of Satan was vulnerable. Then I had an understanding that this was going to end and another uh, panel, if you will, was to come in. I didn't know where it was going or whatever. I was astounded. And uh, then the second panel came in and it was a sword. And from the bottom of the sword, the handle of the sword came blue light. And the top of the sword was uh, like a broad double-edged sword, and that's in this picture. And the top of the sword had white light that came out of it. And at this, in this part of the vision, I felt the power of God. Now, it's one thing to talk about God. It's another thing to experience God. And that, um, that was amazing. And actually, I'm kind of embarrassed, in a sense, to be telling you about this. I'm kind of embarrassed because what the experience was in this true drawing that I have up here is so much different between the two. And also, who am I? It's, you know, I am nothing. And so, anyway, um, I felt the power of God, and it, the power was so, so strong that um, it was very clear that the power of God was greater than the power of Satan. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, that's good to know. You know, of course, of course the power of God is greater than the power of Satan. And then that went away, and then again in laser beam-like light came the next one. The, the, which would end up being the center of the, the five. The next one was the Blessed Mother with half in light and half in dark. In other words, there was light over on this side and it was coming across. And so on the other side, which would be the center point of these, these five panels, the demarcation point, you could see neglect of dust and dirt and 
and things like that. The further you got to that side, the more it became. And I later was to understand this as this being like the dominion of God, and on this side, we'll be saying this is like the dominion of man. In other words, there's a demarcation point. We are not God, okay? And so um, the, the, the uh, understanding that I had from that panel was that force is not the answer. Submitting to the will of God, as Mary did, is the answer. Because I was thinking in my family, a lot of these people are just using, you know, they get in charge and then they do what they want to do. Is that how you're supposed to do it? I mean, it was an honest question. It was one of my questions. And this answered that question. No. No. Force is not the answer. Then that went away. Oh, and it was, it was very striking seeing this, this relief on the Blessed Mother's face. It was a statue. It was a, like a wax, wooden statue, very pretty in the perfectly clear parts. And in the next vision, it was the same, very same statue, but all in light. And the understanding of that that I had was that uh, Mary will intercede for us. That was a great consolation to me. And then that went away, and then the last panel was just a, 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 like a picture of Christ. It was, these were three-dimensional. The first four were three-dimensional. This is just like a picture of Christ. And I was consoled that Christ was in the picture. I mean, I, I always hoped that Christ was God. But having Christ in the picture was like, like um, you know, this is very real. What was striking about this last one was that our Lord had a crown of thorns on, but they were not, there was no blood. He was not, he was very neat and dignified. And it wasn't like the pictures whenever we see Christ with the crown of thorns, we usually see the great um, immolation that occurred. And, this was, and the, the understanding that I had from that was that um, we might profit from suffering in the image of Christ. And then that went away, and um, I went on with my life. And I had an understanding. My understanding was, an interior understanding, that I was supposed to keep going with low plate. And that brings me to this point of our afternoon about groups. It started out with groups. And I gave, I gave you the card. And this, this can come and go, I guess. Um, for, you know, you can never, you can never um, expect somebody else to have the same feelings you have for some kind of a consolation. In any event, um, in any event, I knew that I should continue on with Loquay, and I knew that groups were the right kind of groups, form groups, was really the work of Loquay. Not Loquay, it's, you know, God is at the center of the community. This is not something new, this is everything we already know as we've been talking. And you have the card. You can use the card personally and individually. But what's really needed is to be part of a small group, because a small group keeps you on track just for a purpose of. The first part of the meeting is where one person it focuses on one person. And if we're, if we're honest, everybody is working on something at work that is kind of like a challenge to us about uh, bringing our faith into our work. So they share that. The group uses this, those primary values that we have. And we, um, other people, if they have experience, they share their experience. I was greatly helped last time when I shared a concern that I had, and both people had uh, experience that I could relate to and I could use. It was, it was a great comfort. And then the last part of the meeting, just to be short here, the last part of the, the meeting is you're just visiting with each other or talking or letting the Holy Spirit come in. It's unstructured. So it's got both structure and unstructured part. Thank you.